Good evening from Aguas Calientes, Cala, Mexico. Uh, you, uh, uh, we welcome you to our presentation this evening of uh, Molly Von Howling's uh, UCI Hour Record Attempt. We are your hosts, Ellen Sherrill and Jim Turner. I am Ellen. Jim introduced the event. And uh, because we don't really care to talk much about ourselves, uh, we're going to go ahead and introduce each other. So, introducing my co-host, Jim Turner. Jim says, I'm an old guy. He's 76 years old, a fast 76-year-old, actually, being the our record holder in his master's age group uh, on the track. Uh, he, and he has plenty of experience. After years of bike racing and running, he began track racing seven years ago. He set three world records here at Aguas Calientes in July of 2014 including that uh, hour for his 75 to 79 age group, the flying 200 meters, and the 2K individual pursuit. What a talent. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, let me introduce my co-host. Uh, Ellen is a bike racer with a foot in every discipline, cycling coach, cyclocentric journalist, and all-around cycling enthusiast. She's also a teammate of, of Molly uh, on Metromint cycling team. All right, so let's uh, talk a little bit about what you're seeing here, what you will be watching. The camera's panning around the Velodromo Bicentenario right now. I'd just like to make a quick side note that we're seeing the UCI officials in, uh, in their uh, light blue colored shirts and their khaki trousers, and they've been patrolling the track looking for bits of debris, I suppose. There they are preparing the starting gate. Um, back to what you'll be watching, um, you'll be watching Molly Van Howling making an attempt on the Women's World Hour record, which is an attempt to ride further than any woman has on a, on a bicycle in one hour. She is a highly successful amateur road racer and time trialist who became interested in the hour after the UCI rule change in 2014 to allow for aerodynamic bicycles, since she's a you know, kind of a time trial specialist and not too much into the, the Eddie Merck's drop bars with no aerodynamics. Uh, and then let me give you a definition for the hour, an exact one. It's the record for the longest distance cycled in one hour on a bicycle from a stationary start. And in modern times, uh, it's always been attempted on a velodrome track and Molly has chosen this nice venue at the Velodromo Bicentenario in Aguas Calientes, Mexico. We might point out some things too that uh, you'll start to see in the image here. Uh, it's not showing right now, but I think just a few s seconds ago, they showed the electronic starting gate that Molly will start from. Uh, it's a requirement for our records that the uh, electronic starting gate be used. Uh, other things, we'll maybe point them out a little bit later, uh, well, I'm, uh, I, I, I notice they have, uh, just walking off the screen there, is uh, Molly's uh, chief official. His name's Randy Schaefer, um, and he is an international commissaire. By the rules of the hour record attempts, your chief official has to have uh, the rank of, of, of an uh, international commissaire. And, and Randy is one of those few people in the United States. There's Randy walking that. up the there, stairs. He's, he's just coming up the stairs. He's the famous one. And uh, I, I'm, uh, maybe this is a good time to mention it. The, these international commissaires are, are rare birds. Uh, there are only five international commissaires that are track certified uh, in the whole United States. And... Um, Randy is, is, is one of those. Uh, three of them are based in Colorado Springs, as Randy is, and then um, there, there are two others. Me Mexico, at, at the current time, has no uh, track certified uh, international commissaires, so of course we had to bring Randy in um, to serve in that capacity. Uh, they're panning along the edge of the track now. There's some things here. Of course, you, many of you people are familiar with uh, velodrome tracks, but for those that aren't, You'll notice there's um, a, a wide blue band, we call that. And then just uh, beyond that, you see a black line, then you see a red line. Uh, the strip between the black line and the red line is referred to as the sprinter's lane. The measurement, this is a 250 meter track. Uh, the measurement is done along that black line. 
So, of course, a, an important aspect of that is that Molly will attempt to ride as close as possible to that line uh, during her ride. Uh, you can see uh, a wire coming over from the side. Uh, that's the timing strip. The, 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 the timing is done electronically, and each time Molly crosses that line, it will trigger uh, the electronic timer, which measures time uh, in, in, uh, down to a thousandth of a second, one millisecond. Some other things we might like to look at is, uh, well, we're panning down to Randy now, but uh, note the fairly steep embankment corners of the velodrome at 42 degrees. Um, those are uh, pretty pretty quick when you're you're going fast. Uh, it's a bit more advantageous, I understand, if I understand correctly, Jim, than uh, yes, something that, that's correct. Yeah. something less steeply banked like Molly's home velodrome of uh, Hellier in California. Um, have we uh, caught all the major points here? There's uh, the uh, laps to go, but I guess that's a lap counter. And is that, counter, is that a UCI yeah. official who's going to be flipping those all the way through? Well, there's, there's one thing strange about that. If, if I'm looking at it correctly, I only see two digits. Yeah. And, uh, What's up when with Molly, that? Molly is going to be, <laughs> she, we're hoping that she's over 184 laps. Oh, and, yeah. uh, and, and since I've mentioned that number, the, the number, uh, the, the, the current women's world record that's, that's held by Leontine von Morsel uh, was set in 2003. And I'll be mentioning this distance numerous times. We will be mentioning this distance. The current record is 46.065 kilometers. So uh, moving off what we're seeing on the track, let's just go over Molly's background a little bit. Uh, she's the current U.S. and Pan American Elite Hour record holder. Um, oh, I don't know if you can hear that on our microphones, but they're testing out the 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 beeper on the starting gate. I guess, Jim. I don't know. Maybe they're yeah, testing that, out that, its ability are, those to are the actually tones that will be, uh, release used to her. Set, set Molly off. Okay, so back to Molly. Uh, she's the current U.S. and Pan American Elite Hour record holder. She's a five-time UCI World. Uh, champion altogether in the, di um, pardon me, the disciplines of combined both time trial and road race events. So tell us about her academic career, Jim, well, which um, is another important part it, of her. It certainly is, and it's a certain, it's a very unique aspect of um, of, of Molly. Uh, she she is a high level professional. Mo Molly is uh, a professor of law at the University of California at Berkeley, and she's uh, an associate, uh, associate dean there in the law, in the law school. We'll, we'll, um, we'll have uh, some more detailed information about that. But remember, we have to remember here that Molly, Molly is an amateur. Uh, most of the men, of course, that you've seen attempt the, the men's hour record, they're, they're professional cyclists. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about this a bit later, but the, there's only been one woman who has uh, attempted the record. This is only the second attempt from a woman, and it's, it's being done uh, by, by an amateur, a true amateur. So uh, let me just uh, give you a quick, uh, you know, Molly's, Molly's professional resume, just, you know, so that you can understand that it's, uh, I mean, she's highly regarded in her field. She's a professor of law and associate dean and a faculty co-director of the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology. She, her uh, teaching and research interests include intellectual property, law and technology, property and food law. She served on the library committee of the UC Berkeley Academic Senate on its commission on the future in UC Berkeley Library. She's the co-founder of the Authors Alliance and serves on the board of directors at Creative Commons. Um, I think that because uh, we're kind of closing in on the start here, we might have to uh, skip that story you were going to tell Jim. But oh, we can pick that up later. Yeah, suffice it to say that she's, um, you know, she's the real deal academically as well as as an athlete, which is part of what impresses us. She's so well-rounded. Let me just go, let us uh, go over Molly's hour history a bit. Um, on December 14th, 2014, she broke the 24-year-old American record set in Colorado Springs by Carolyn Donnelly, which was 44.028 kilometers at the Carson Velodrome in California at 44.173 kilometers. 
Her, her second attempt at the hour was done here at Aguas Calientes back in, in February, February 25th to be exact. Uh, the distance she covered then was 45.637 kilometers. And then uh, of, of great interest, of course, is she made her second attempt here at Aguas Calientes, third attempt overall, on July 3rd. And at that time, she covered a distance of 46.088 kilometers. That is 23 meters f further than the current women's world record. Uh, we'll talk about later why that was not an official uh, women's world record, uh, but we'll, we'll come back to that. We'd like to mention uh, another very important person here tonight who won't be physically riding around the track, but uh, oh, there he comes. Oh, if this camera just pans a little bit over, he's going to walk into the screen with Molly right behind him. Is Molly's uh, husband and partner since college, Rob Van Howling. He is basically Molly's wrench. He's the brains behind the equipment and the logistics that makes all of this uh, these truly big things achievable for, for Molly. Rob is just an equipment genius and he loves to geek out over this technology. Well, it looks like she's got a nice vest on, keeping nice and cool in this warm velodrome. Uh, not sure if we have time for men's hour record history, maybe start going over it and actually, uh, yeah, we can start going over that a little bit. We might have to come back to it as we watch Molly taking in her last little bit of sugar before she has to start this effort with no fuel and no well, water. Yeah, uh, just before we do that, I might mention one more thing about Rob. Uh, Rob is also a, a professor uh, at the University of California at Berkeley uh, in the political science department. So both of these, both of these folks are professors at UC Berkeley. Um, if, if, if you're, I'm sure many of you watching this are uh, from, perhaps from Europe or other parts of the world, and, and may not be familiar with uh, UC Berkeley, but it is, is one of the most prestigious colleges uh, in the United States. Uh, let's, let's try to um, talk a bit, just get through some men's hour history and women's hour history uh, a bit. The UCI hour record before, um, uh, before 2014 was a Merck spike format, which is a standard drop bar road bike with no aerodynamic tubing um, and uh, and then the UCI changed the rule in 1997 uh, in the middle of this time um, so it was it was Merck's bike and then people started evolving various we'll talk a bit more about this start evolving various other types of positions and then they changed their mind decided that retrospectively in 19 uh, 97 that all the strange so-called strange positions and whatnot and fancy equipment that had uh, been used from 1983 forward were not going to be allowed so they retroactively removed prior hour holders who had done so on modern or novel bikes which is all the attempts post 1983 and that includes Francisco Moser's attempt um, uh, with a disc wheel and a skin suit, as well as various records from Graham Obrey, Miguel Indurain, Tony Rominger, and Chris Boardman. Um, I don't know if uh, we have a photo here that would show the Obrey and Boardman positions briefly. Um, those would be a um, couple of, actually, I think these are both photos of Graham Obrey, but one shows his odd time trial position with the, his chest is a bit off the bars but usually it's uh was sunk straight down onto the bars here and then uh the next one shows graham in the so-called superman position which was very successful in setting many records but uh it was uh just kind of too out to lunch for the uci so that kind of uh was retrospectively disallowed looks like molly's ice vest is coming off the bike's there. She's out of her slippers and into her shoes. I uh, looks like we got still five minutes to go on our clock, um, but I I can't quite read the electronic timer over here, so she may be a bit closer yeah, than yeah, we think up of, here in the booth. I'm expecting Molly to to uh, ride a few warm up laps here. Ah, warm up <laughs> but laps. But that's not. Uh, that's not absolutely clear at this point if she's going to do that. How about we uh, quickly or we try to. 
Uh, let me cover some more of this our record history while we find out. Uh oh, Visine. <laughs> or something. Some drops in the eyes, as well as some water on the head. That's a good way to start. She'll get sprayed down here in a commercially available cooling solution of, of alcohol at some point, unless I missed that. Um, back to the, uh, the, the non-Eddie Merckx, so-called Eddie Merckx bike attempts. They were then relegated to something called the best human effort. You could still try uh, at this point, even though modern time trial bikes are allowed for the, uh, a title called the Athlete's Hour, which is still on that old school Eddie Merckx bike. But uh, interest is fairly low, and I believe this to be a large part of the reason why the UCI changed the rule to unify the aero track bike and Merckx records into a single hour. And, and uh, based on that, just last year, uh, the UNIS, UCI, which is the international governing body for, for cycling, um, created a new record that they call the UCI Unified Hour Record. That came into place uh, just last year. And the, the types of bikes that are allowed now under, the, under those rules are aerodynamic bikes. Uh, you, you still can't use the, these crazy positions like the Superman positions and, and those but the bikes themselves are now, they're now allowed to use uh, any bike that would be considered uh, an acceptable bike for ordinary time track events, for example, like the individual pursuit or the team pursuit, uh, or like the kilometer or 500 meter. Those bikes can have disc wheels, they can have aero bars, uh, the bikes themselves are aerodynamic, the, uh, the athletes can wear aerodynamic equipment. The, for example, you'll notice that Molly has a very, very aerodynamic uh, helmet that she's he, she's riding on right now um following the uh the rule change to this type of uh molly's kind of riding a classic track pursuit time trial bike here seen on her warm-up um just spinning it out and trying out the velodrome i guess uh you know many of you will be familiar with the, the uh, flurry of of men's hour record attempts uh since the rule change in may uh, 2014. There have been eight attempts, and it's been broken five times by Jens Vaught, Matthias Brandel, Rohan Dennis, Alex Dowsett, and currently held by Sir Bradley Wiggins at 54.526 kilometers from June 7, 2015. How about some women's hour history? Well, there's not as much, of course. Uh, the the first women's record was set back in 1955. Uh, her, her name was Tamara Novakova. And the distance she covered was 38.473 kilometers. So that was about uh, 60 years ago. As I mentioned before, and we'll probably mention several times, the, the current World Women's uh, UCI hour record is held by Leontine Zillard von Morsel. It was set in 2003, and incidentally, was also set in Mexico City. Uh, the distance she covered was uh, 46.065 kilometers. The, the, uh, the velodrome in Mexico City is uh, at a slightly, we're, we're about 6,200 feet elevation here. Uh, the velodrome in Mexico City was closer to 7,000 feet. So the velodrome that she used was slightly higher than the one that Molly is riding on here. Just a bit though, we're, uh, we're at uh, a, a fair altitude here, about 800 feet down or so. Um, there's only been one attempt since uh, uh, Leontine set her record uh, all the way back in 2003 uh, since the UCI rule change, uh, and that was Dame Sarah Story, who made an attempt on February 28th of this year, 2015. She uh, did not break Van Morsel's record. She rode a British record of 45.502 kilometers. Um, Impressive, but uh, it you know kind of left a left a spot where where Molly could get in here. I, I might say that you could you could probably guess that I'm a big fan of the hour record. I, I've watched all of the eight televised men's attempts, and of course I watched uh, Dame uh, Sarah Story's attempt. Uh, she she made a tremendous effort in her ride. I, uh, I she gave everything possible, and uh, and it was good that she got the British record but did, did fall short of, of the, uh, the world record. Well, it looks like Molly's has come down to the blue band and probably make her way to the apron here. She's got the feel of the track, got the legs going. 
and uh, coming back to a stop. There's Rob giving her some last minute. He's awfully smiley. <laughs> I love it. He's excited. He's going to watch her go real fast. And there's the chief commissaire, Randy, coming up the ramp. I, uh, I see a spray bottle in front of her, some last minute uh, sugary blocks, and get her nice and cool. Ellen, is that spray, is that just water, or do you think it's some kind of no, an alcohol No, no, I talked to Rob earlier. It's, a, it's an alcohol-based spray that's commercially available. Uh -huh. I think he, he told me the name, but I failed to write it down. It's called, you know, ice, ice body or ice cool body, something like that. It's something you could buy. Uh, um, but, you know, uh, there's a uh, famous picture of Chris Boardman getting sprayed down and, and I think just straight rubbing alcohol at one point before he was making a attempt on the hour in a very hot velodrome. So this presumably is a, a bit more mellow. Rob's bringing her bike to the starting block. Um, she will need to walk up to the starting block, the starting gate, excuse me, in, uh, in her cycling shoes. And, uh, Jim, uh, you, you warned me when <laughs> yeah. we were riding around this nice velodrome yesterday that I'd better be careful when I actually walked up onto the track embankment, not in my grippy tennis shoes. Yeah, of those, why. those cleats on the, on your cycling shoes are not the best to be walking up. Uh, of course, that's that's the that's the shallowest part of the track right there, uh, but it's still significantly banked, and you can easily uh, find your feet slipping out from under you if you if you don't if you aren't careful about uh, how you, how you get up to the bike. So she's a she's a getting to be a seasoned expert here, but she'll want to be very careful um, in uh, in her in making her way even that short way up to the bike. Uh, so let's tell me. I mean, they're they're taking a, you know a good look at the starting gate, a, presumably a good look at the front wheel. Uh, I would assume that that contact point of the front wheel is basically just behind that timing um, strip. That's that's right, Ellen. The, the the front of the wheel is supposed to be lined up with uh, with the actual starting lines, and we're talking only a matter of inches here, but that's technically how it has to be set up. There's a magic and, um, spray, by the and way. You'll, you'll, you'll notice that Molly will have her crank arms on her bike set in the, exactly in the position she wants them so that when she takes that first pedal stroke to come out of the starting gate, uh, she's able to uh, apply uh, some, a good amount of force on that very first stroke. Okay, she's got her eyes closed. <laughs> Doesn't want any, no, any you, of that getting in her eyes. Absolutely not. <laughs> She's, she's, she's smiling, I, I, grinning, I can and bearing it. I think it's cooling her <laughs> off. It's like, ooh, that's cold. That's you know, cold. when someone touches a, I don't know, <laughs> ice, ice cloth to your neck and, ooh. Uh, that's probably pretty cold right there. Yeah. Uh, that's good. Uh, you'll certainly heat up. Uh, I'll, I'll be talking more about the, uh, the parameters here. Uh, Jim has this fancy little toy. It tells us... Uh, about, I believe, uh, barometric pressure, temperature, and, well, wind speed, which isn't really relevant here in the indoor velodrome, but we, oh. uh, <laughs> we'll talk a bit about that later. Okay. All right. There, there's a friendly luck, kiss Molly. from Rob. Uh, we'll, yeah, we'll be talking about the uh, temperature, the humidity, and the barometric pressure here uh, at, at some length later. Uh, but if you'd like to know how we're starting out here, the temperature right now is almost exactly 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Here we Which go. Which for you European folks would be 27 degrees. All right. Okay. Making her way up She's to the bike. Her way up. No slips. Much more pro than me. Getting seated on the bike. And uh, looks like she's about uh, going to be about, uh, depending on how long to the start here, five or six minutes behind the projected start. Um, Okay, there's the 10 second time, and you'll Here hear go, five folks. tones. Totally focused. Oh, that was, oh, 30, that was okay. 30 seconds, excuse me. She's the next still tone totally you'll focused. hear will be 10 seconds, and then you'll hear tones from five down to one, and then the start tone will be a different tone. You'll, you uh, you'll can probably hear that, but let's just watch.
She's underway. I had to take the mic away from my face and give a quick whoop. I'm aware that I can't uh, be too loud here, but she's got to get some cheers. Settling into that position, getting up to speed. Um, tell us, uh, the extra time to get up to speed uh, from completely at rest makes a big impact on your first lap. Uh, and this has typically been seven seconds or so for Molly. Uh, and these seconds have to be factored into the pacing for the rest of the hour, such that the time can be made up over the remainder of the effort. But uh, it's, it's a bit tricky. So yeah, let, this would be a good time to this is a good time to uh, explain a little bit about the uh, display that you see at the bottom of the screen. Uh, in the leftmost position, that will be the elapsed time. So for, she's a, right as I speak. She, there, there is the first minute in. You'll see the lap count. Uh, the lap split gives the time that it took her to cover the prior lap, uh, and the meters is is the whole number of laps that she's completed times 250 meters. Now, I particularly need to, to caution you about the uh, kilometer per hour uh, reading. The, the, the distance that Molly ultimately needs to achieve there is 46.065 kilometers. Uh, so at the end of the hour, we want to see that average speed up to that. But that seven seconds that she, she gave up during the starting lap, uh, that, that seven seconds is gone forever. And it has to be gradually uh, made, made up over the course of, of quite a few initial laps. So uh, you, you shouldn't be surprised to see her, her average kilometer per hour speed running uh, be, behind the, the ultimate value she's shooting for. The, the, the field that you should focus your attention on is the one called uh, WR, which is world record plus or minus. When it's green, that means she's that much ahead of uh, her target pace. And that's and for the lap or for? for overall, overall. Overall. Yeah. Yes. That, that so she's currently, just to speak for right now, 1.4 seconds up on the current record. Right. She, she, exactly. Uh, if, if bad things happen uh, and she got behind, that field would turn to a uh, red color and it would, show, uh, it would show a negative number. But uh, she's obviously had a good start here. Um, I, I might want to mention that her, her target lap times need to be about 19.5 seconds each. So that's the kind of lap splits that, that she'll be shooting for. And it looks like she's uh, generally, you know, right under this, pretty consistent uh, with, I've been seeing 19.4-something uh, for most of these. And uh, you probably can't hear it on your broadcast, but... Uh, you know, up here, sitting above the track in the commentator's booth, we can hear Rob yelling at her whether she's up or whether she's right on target. And it sounds like the pacing is, is uh, going very well for the two of them. Um, so um, I, that uh, covers what you'd like to caution the viewers with about what we're seeing at the bottom of the screen, right, Jim? Uh, yeah, I think I think we've covered those. Okay. Uh, and the the one that you uh, want to focus your attention on is that uh, WR field, which is, shows that she's either ahead or behind schedule. And a little bit later, we have a, a sheet here that has some some key times and uh, the distance that we're hoping she would have covered by uh, those times and the number of laps she would have done by then. So when we get to some of those key points. Maybe we'll wait till, you know, 20 or 30 minutes in, but we can let you know if, uh, you know, well, it'll be pretty obvious, but if that's right on schedule. So, um, uh, Jim, you have, a, you know, quite a bit of your own experience with uh, that standing start and, you know, losing that time. And uh, I was just wondering, because I have no personal experience with the starting gate, I was just kind of wondering, does it require a lot of upper body effort? It kind of well, looks like it does. Well, n not so much upper body strength. I would say, if anything, it requires more core strength. Uh, for those four, first four or five pedal strokes that you take, uh, you want to have your arms stiff and straight. And, and, the, and the stronger your core is, the more you can tighten up those abdominal muscles. Uh, that helps you get off the, uh, off the starting block fast. After you get about five pedal strokes in, 
then then you can start to get in kind of a more more normal type of uh, cycling pattern. So I, I wouldn't say that it takes upper body strength, and uh, the, the the start uh, uh, in in a short track event like a 500 meter or a kilometer or an individual pursuit. Uh, it's very critical to riding a fast time. In an hour, uh, not so much. I mean, Molly has a whole hour to make up uh, whatever time she might have been uh, behind her, her normal lap times. Uh, great. Um, I was also curious, have you ever found, in spite of the fact that you're saying that most of the effort comes from your core, uh, it, do you think that the this, this cost of starting, that extra effort, costs you later in the hour? Uh, that's a that's a close judgment that you have to make. I, I mean, for example, in, in you, if you're doing a very short track event like a 500 meter or uh, a kilometer, uh, you just have to kill it on the start, just absolutely as hard as you could go. You certainly wouldn't do that. Uh, you certainly wouldn't do that in an hour record attempt. And, and Molly knows uh, that that's seven seconds that she gives up in the first lap. That's all factored into her schedule, and uh, you can see she's. Uh, She's at already almost two and a half seconds up on, on her schedule, and we're only, we, haven't, we haven't quite got 20 laps in yet. Yeah, she seems to be uh, doing a fairly good job pacing herself. Uh, I don't know if she considers herself to be, or if Rob, rather, would, uh, the calculations would consider this to be a little on the hot side, but for the most part, consistent and fast. So uh, hopefully we just see this for the next... Uh, Mm, what is it? It's, uh, 53 minutes or so. Oh, let's see. Yes, it's about that. I'm coming up on uh, seven minutes in. We have several topics that we want to bring up during our, our presentation here. Uh, let's turn now our attention a little bit to the, the UCI rules that pertain to doing an hour record. Um, the UCI is very specific about facilities, timing, equipment, officials, results confirmation. Uh, so great care must be taken to, to comply with all, all those rules uh, to have a, to, uh, an accredited uh, record performance. And I think, again, we can credit Rob Van Howling with being a very key factor in, in this particular arena of uh, setting it all up. His attention to detail and his, um, his expertise in dealing with uh, uh, logistics and uh, legalities and various rules and whatnot uh, it makes it makes it possible to set all these things in motion um, plenty of our record holders over the years have discovered to their great dismay at the last minute um, which Molly appears to have totally avoided having uh, you know the start gone well and everything uh, that their bike or their position or their shoe covers uh, I uh, uh, reference uh, Michael Hutchinson there um, are declared illegal in some manner by the UCI just potentially uh, just a few minutes before their start which isn't doesn't put the rider in a very good space to if they even can start uh, to uh, get going on on a world record attempt so uh, attention to great detail pretty far you know before actual race day is is very very worthwhile uh, it might be worthwhile <clears throat> to mention um, a, a few of these specific uh, UCI rules. Uh, I'll, I'll just read them from, from the rule book here. Uh, one says, a rider making an attempt must be included in the UCI registered testing pool and must participate in the athlete biological passport program in accordance with its rules. Uh, we'll talk more later about the, the, the biological passport. Uh, that that particular rule was introduced only in February of this year. Which I did not know and just kind of shocked me. I would have assumed that this went back years and years, although come to think of it, I, I can't, can't see Graham Obrey signing up for the biological passport. <laughs> um, uh, we're going to kind of gloss over some of the more boring sounding rules, but uh, uh, again, just to re-mention that uh, the chief official must be a track certified international commissaire, which, as Jim pointed out, are sort of rare birds. And the uh, record setting rider must submit to a drug test after the event. Uh, but uh, this is sort of par for the course for um, UCI road and cyclocross and track races. So that kind of makes sense for setting a world record. 
And just to mention one more rule, uh, the distance covered shall be rounded down to the nearest meter. The hour record may not be beaten by less than one meter. So wouldn't that be a thing? Wouldn't that be something if it were one meter? Oh half, yeah, uh, you know, <laughs> that point would be something. four tenths of a meter further and uh, uh, have it not count. Yeah, uh, look well, looking a bit better than that at this point, but. Uh, that's uh, you know, probably an important thing that they uh, that they set down there. Uh, shouting out the ten minute mark to Molly. And you you you've noticed that her average uh, kilometer per hour speed is is creeping up. It's getting up uh, pretty close to forty six kilometers per hour. Again, that is largely due to making up those uh, those few seconds in the, the starting lap, correct? Right, it, it is, and it, it's surprising. It, it takes quite a few laps to make that up. I wouldn't be surprised uh, if Molly didn't get up to, to target speed uh, until she's up around maybe, perhaps even 70 or 80 laps. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, well, uh, you know, at least we're seeing uh, uh, it, that that will creep up and seeing those average lap splits or the individual lap splits rather they're they're pretty spot on and uh 3.6 seconds up on the the record at this yeah. point I'm, I'm seeing two things here that i i like a lot so far ellen i like that 3.8 seconds and i like what molly is doing on uh, s staying close to that black line i was uh, trying she, she, to she take a look up, at that she up some but uh, generally, I think she's doing a, a pretty good job of staying right on that. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more later uh, about the consequences of riding above the black line. We'll, we'll come to that bit later. We uh, thought that maybe we'd talk a bit about the, the biological passport. So, Jim, do you want to give a definition and well, state yeah, its sure. purpose? Well, sure. The basic idea of the, the biological passport, um, it was introduced, I, I think it was in maybe 2009, and it was an attempt by the UCI and other people to, to combat the, the rampant uh, uh, performance-enhancing drug abuse that took place prior to that. The idea behind the biological passport is that the writer accumulates a, a history over a course of time of what are his normal uh, blood parameters and hormone parameters. So. What, what you can do then is you, you track that over time, and, and the longer the time, the better, uh, because then you, you know better what's normal for the rider. So then what happens is you start looking for de departures from those normal values. And a, a consequence of that is that if a person, uh, if some of their blood parameters or hormone parameters get too far out of line, uh, they, they can be sanctioned with a, a, a penalty even though they never actually failed a drug test. Uh, so um, one thing very notable uh, in particular about the, the hour record and the disparity between the men's and women's attempts is that it's very costly. And uh, as mentioned before, it's very recent, um, only uh, instated for the hour record since uh, 2015. and. Uh, uh, the the deal is uh, for the men uh, in their the the pro tour circuit um, those men's teams those riders who race in the Tour de France and the classics and and other uh, UCI events are uh, required uh, to be enrolled in the biological passport program and so all of those professional males teams pay for that for them. Um, Whereas uh, women's teams don't have to do that because in women's um, pro tour UCI events, uh, those women are not required to be in the biological passport. And this is just a bit of a disparity between the sexes. Um, I'm not sure if I would like to, you know, state a specific explanation of, of that, but it is just how it is right now. And uh, as a result, women uh, must be essentially pay for themselves to be enrolled in the biological passport. Molly is in a position as, you know, a highly successful uh, career professional that she is able to, um, uh, you know, have the income for the funds to enroll in the program, which has uh, enabled her to uh, uh, race this 
our record attempt. I have a little story to tell you about uh, one of Molly's experiences with the, uh, the biological passport in his testing. Uh, toward the end of May, uh, Molly and Rob uh, were, were relocating up to Mammoth Lakes, California for altitude training. Uh, Mammoth Lakes is a, a ski resort community uh, on the eastern side of the Sierra Mountains. And the elevation there at Mammoth Lakes is about 8,000 feet. So it's, it's an ideal place to do um, altitude training. I've, I've gone there many times myself for training. <clears throat> well, as part of the biological passport, one of the rules is that you have to maintain uh, a, a, re a report of what's called your whereabouts. You have to let the UCI, or not the UCI, I guess the drug tester, uh, the drug testing uh, as WADA, know w where you are at all times. And uh, you even have to, on certain times, have to give them a one hour time frame where you're going to be. Well, Rob and Molly headed, uh, they live in the Bay Area. It's about a six hour drive over to Mammoth Lakes from there. They headed over there one evening and uh, it was the first, first time they ever got there. They got there about 10 o'clock at night. And lo and behold, there was a drug tester sitting there waiting for Molly to do her uh, first uh, test uh, out of, away from her home area. I, I thought it was just amazing that the, the, the drug tester uh, had come up there from Los Angeles to Mammoth Lakes to, to do the test. Well, I, um, I guess my, my own little story that I could add is that uh, I uh, had, had Molly uh, tell myself and some other comrades that we uh, couldn't have our dinner date or we could continue our, our uh, multi-person dinner date past nine, but she would have to be home at that time. And she didn't mention what that was. I later found out that it was because of the time that she specified that the drug tester could arrive and she would definitely be home. So uh, it's been a fairly large commitment. Um, the biological passport program is, uh, it's what, a five to 10 months that you must be enrolled? That's and the requirement. Yeah, you have to be on the program at least five months to uh, to be able to execute a, a valid UCI hour record attempt. And, and going back to Molly's uh, hour ride that she did here in, uh, July, on July 3rd, she exceeded the, the current world record distance by 23 meters. The only reason that that was not an official UCI hour record was because she'd only been on the biological passport program about three months at that time. Uh, we're, we're two months later now, so, so she's got her, uh, she's got her uh, five, uh, five months in on that program, and that's exactly why this, this uh, effort tonight is, is an official uh, hour record attempt. So uh, let's, uh, let's move on to uh, the topic of, of the black line, which we mentioned. Jim mentioned that she's doing a, a fairly good job. She's drifting a bit, especially on the corners, which is very hard not to do uh, above the black line, but the idea is that since that black line it signifies the shortest distance around the track. Um, it's you basically used as the measurement tool for the hours ride distance, uh, rather than, you know, it's not like she has a Garmin on her bike and it's tracing all the wiggles and adding a little extra <laughs> distance. So uh, Jim presented me with a chart some days ago that uh, states the cost of departure from the black line. Um, and this is when you're riding, say, an inch or two inches, three inches above the black line, you know, that's higher up on the track, and how much extra distance this would add to what you were officially recorded distance for riding your hour. And it's incredibly costly. It kind of blew me away. Riding just one inch above the track, which you know, from from this distance, as the camera tracks Molly around the track, you probably could barely see it all. It uh, it costs you, um, it's not a great deal, a tenth of a lap by the end of the hour, but, you know, in the scheme of world records, that could mean everything. Um, if you're just four inches of, above the black line, uh, which seems pretty reasonable to me, uh, that puts you nearly half a, lap, half a lap down after an hour, and by eight inches, you're almost a full lap down after an hour. Yeah, I, the thing that, that, that makes it maybe hard for people to understand that is you're, you're not losing uh, all that much on one lap, but you have to remember that that amount is, is being multiplied by a very large number. Uh, she's going to be doing 184 laps. 
So if, if it's only a small amount, it gets multiplied by 184. Um, so yeah, I uh, have very little track experience myself. I'm not the seasoned old salt that Jim is, and uh, I uh, have done some, some track events, but they're, uh, hey, Rob's yelling 20 minutes at Molly, keep her on track. Um, uh, yeah, I've only really done mass start events on the track, and the black line doesn't mean too much, uh, except for, you know, maybe you shouldn't go below it. Um, and uh, it wasn't until yesterday when Jim uh, encouraged me to ride on this amazing velodrome, I went out there and had a little taste of trying to trace the black line myself, and it's incredibly difficult, and I, I wasn't even, you know, riding at the very edge of what I could possibly sustain for an hour. I was just maybe like riding my bike a little hard and to be riding on that black line, trying to just ride your bike right down it or just above it when you're at that level of effort is just incredibly difficult. It takes tremendous concentration and I have the utmost respect for what she's achieving right now. Just another comment or two about the black line. Uh, if, if you look closely at the track, you, you see there's actually a little bit of space inside the black line uh, before you start uh, getting into those, <clears throat> those red sponges that you see around the turns on the track. Those sponges are put there to, uh, to prevent the rider from uh, short, shortcutting the lap by cutting inside too much. Uh, on the straightaway, of course, it doesn't matter where you are, but on the turns, uh, you, you could shorten the distance by coming inside. So uh, moving on to uh, some environmental factors, which we briefly touched on as Jim looked at his uh, measurement tool. It's a, it's a device called a Kestrel, which I have used in field work once upon a time. It's pretty neat for, uh, you know, when you're out there on the, the open road uh, or out in the forest or whatever for me measuring wind speed, but it does some atmospheric readings as well. Um, Let's see, actually, before we get to the Kestrel, let's talk about the altitude here again. It's, uh, again, uh, here we are at 6,200 feet, which is 1,890 meters above sea level. And uh, Molly's chosen this velodrome in part for its altitude. Uh, the advantage of that is that th uh, uh, at altitude, the air is thinner, and this leads to less atmospheric resistance. And so, Faster overall speeds are possible at the same the same wattage. Um, of course, I think most most of you are familiar with the negative impact of altitude. There's just less oxygen up here for the rider to be breathing, and that inhib inhibits power output. So uh, accl acclimatization partially, but can't fully mitigate this. A properly acclimated rider probably benefits up to a point of no return when the altitude is is too high. Um, and uh, we have a, a graph here that's going to come onto the screen that will uh, kind of shows the, the effect of the acclimatized athlete above and the non-acclimatized athlete below at various elevations. You can see the speed of the rider uh, for both cases kind of comes up to about two to three thousand meters. Uh, which goes to well over what we're at here, being not even 2,000 meters, uh, and then comes down as the altitude negatively impacts the rider's ability to put out power. Um, so uh, this, this seems uh, Mexico City is probably a fairly good balance as well. Colorado Springs is, is also at the same altitude as Aguas Calientes, and uh, for an altitude record, these are all pretty good choices. Um, humidity, Jim, okay, another well factor. Let's, yeah, let's, let's talk about the environmental factors here. Uh, in some way, I, I classify them as the three H's, uh, heat, height, and humidity. Uh, the, the, the first factor um, that we, we might mention is heat or temperature. Hot air is faster because it's thinner and uh, it has a, a fairly profound effect. Uh, I, uh, I checked some calculations, and as the, as the temperature increases by 10 degrees Fahrenheit, or let's say five degrees centigrade, 
the, the air density reduces by about 2%. So it's about a 2% a reduction for every uh, 10 degrees Fahrenheit or 5 degrees centigrade. Two uh, percent is a big deal on unredu unreduced air, uh, unreduced uh, air, air uh, density. Uh, humidity isn't as strong a factor, but it still plays a role. And I think this is a little bit non-intuitive for people. Uh, high right. humidity is is actually faster than, than lower humidity. And if you if you run through the numbers, it works out that um, that the humidity uh, Every 10% increase in humidity reduces the air density by about 0.2%. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that that's mostly counterintuitive because when the humidity is high, people, it's a, I, most of us, especially when it's hot, you kind of feel like you're swimming through the air. It feels thick, but in fact, if you go back to your chemistry lessons, uh, that's not the case. And can I just add as a side note, uh, this is probably not at all a factor, aside from cooling the temperature of the velodrome a bit, uh, Molly probably can't hear it over the noise of her bike and through that time trial helmet, but we've begun to hear uh, quite a bit of rain on the roof of the velodrome and it's making a decent amount of noise. Probably will cool the velodrome significantly over the next half an hour or so. What's the temperature right now? Well, it will, let, let me, uh, let me come out back to all those factors we just spoke about, uh, Ellen. Uh, the, the current temperature right now is uh, 79 degrees Fahrenheit, which would be about uh, uh, 26 degrees centigrade. The, um, the humidity right now is 56%. Uh, I imagine you folks can be begin to hear in the background noise that that rushing sound that you hear is uh, heavy rain pouring down on the roof of the velodrome. Uh, and then to complete my data, um, the, the barometric pressure here is 813 millibars. Uh, that is far, far below what you have at sea level. Uh, the, the, the standard air, uh, air pressure at, at sea level is 1,013 millibars. We're exactly 200 millibars below that. Uh, I mean, just as a point of comparison, back when Brad Wiggins did his hour record attempt, he had the un misfortune to hit a relatively high pressure day, and the barometric pressure when he did his attempt was 1,036. Uh, th this uh, low pressure, it's, it's about 20% lower than uh, the sea level, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, big, it's a big advantage. Uh, all those factors, the temperature, the humidity, and the, and the altitude bring the... Um, uh, bring the air density down. So one factor that isn't a factor uh, in this indoor velodrome is wind. Um, the air is pretty still unless you're Molly moving at 19 or pardon me uh, 46 plus kilometers per hour. Um, and so many of the successful attempts over the years uh, have uh, have been done indoors because it's just that, I mean, if it were to be windy, that could be a hugely negative factor for the rider. Um, but, you know, uh, Van Morsel's record, which uh, Molly's aiming to break here today, was at altitude in Mexico City, but in fact was outdoors. So presumably she did that on a, a reasonably still day. Um, and then other notable successes outdoors were Obrey's uh, first British record was uh, on a rather, rather windy day, and he simply had much different speeds down the front stretch of the, the velodrome and, and going back the other direction. Um, I imagine he just kept his pressure fairly steady on the pedals and still managed to ride pretty well, but it's definitely a factor in those choosing an outdoor venue. Uh, Colorado Springs Velodrome, for instance, is outdoors, and a whole bunch of records have been set on that. So, moving on to another topic for the time. Uh, how about we go over pacing strategy, Jim? Yeah, let's, uh, let's see if we can bring up that uh, graphic. This would be a good time to... Uh, to yeah, uh, even pacing strategy is generally recognized as the most likely to succeed. Attemptees who have begun too hot uh, often fail. You can see in this graph here, um, Jack Bowbridge in particular, it's a bit fuzzy, but it's that orange line. He started uh, very, very hot on his attempt and 
and it he really paid for it later. Bradley Wiggins is up at the top there, and he was very consistent. Uh, Jens Vaught was much slower overall, but his pacing was actually decent, whereas you can see uh, fading away the, the Dowsett line. Uh, Alex Dowsett apparently was quite conservative on his pacing, and he really uh, probably got the signal that he could totally pick it up at the end. Um, so even pacing, as we touched on a bit earlier, is, is uh, pretty important. And uh, just, uh, that we, don't, we don't have the graphic up anymore, but I, I want to give uh, credit to Xavier Disley for providing that graphic for us. Yes, thank you. Um, I uh, thought that I might like to tell a little story about pacing, and uh, I, I learned of this uh, when I read Michael Hutchinson's book, The Hour, and it was a, it's the account of how even Eddie Merckx paid for his lack of proper pacing in his 1972 attempt in Mexico City. He did take the hour that day, but he was expected to ride well over 50K on that day, and he fell far short of that. So the excerpt I wanted to read from Hutchinson's book, The Hour, he probably could have done over 50K, but he decided he'd like to break the 10 kilometer and 20 kilometer records along the way. To put it in some contrast, he rode the first kilometer in 70 seconds, and that was only six kilometers outside the world record for riding a single kilometer incredibly fast, set on the same track. He thought his time, though, was, or pardon me, his time through the uh, five kilometer mark was world class for that distance, too. He got the full set of records, but only, quote, in quotes, 49.431 kilometers per hour. He was unable to speak for several minutes afterwards. When he did, he said, how I ache, I can hardly move. It was the longest hour of my career. It was terrible. You have no idea what kind of intense effort it is until you have done it. The record demands total effort, permanent and intense. I will never try it again. He never did. Uh, he never did. He said, he, pardon me, <laughs> he subsequently said he felt the hour had taken years off his life. So now that we're over almost 33 minutes into this, uh, I, I doubt Molly's to the point of feeling like it's taking years off her life, but it's, it's possible she's really starting to feel it. Yeah. So I, uh, uh, I have a little uh, story here to tell I, I, I created. Uh, I, I call it what it's like to ride like Molly. So if you'd like to, I, I think it's the case with, with any great athlete, the thing that always impresses me about them uh, is they make it look easy. Well, believe me, what she's doing is not easy. And if you want to think of it, here, here's a way to think about that. Suppose you go out on your road bike uh, or your time trial bike Find a flat stretch of road that's at least a half a mile long and get your bike up to 28.6 miles per hour. Now, probably some of you can't even go that fast even briefly, but maybe some of you can. Suppose you do that. Have your interval timer or, or your, uh, uh, your, your stopwatch on your, on your bicycle computer set up to have you go for a minute. Go at that speed for one minute. That's all I'm asking, just one minute. See what your average speed was for that one minute. Did you hold 28.6 miles an hour? If you didn't hold 28.6 miles per hour or 46 kilometers per hour, you're not gonna set an hour record. Okay, great, you've done that. Now, go do that 59 more times without stopping. And there's a couple other things to keep in mind. You're on a fixed gear bike. You can never coast. When you're on a fixed gear bike, the, the, the pedals and the wheels are always turning. Oh, and another thing, you can't change gears either. You've only got one gear. And then if you want to make it even a little bit harder, suppose you try to do that and uh, you're on a road, let's say you want to follow the fog line or the bike lane line. Don't get more than a few inches away from that line the whole time you do your ride. That's what it's like to do like Molly. That sounds awfully hard, Jim. That's a well put. Um, it's a 
pretty incredible. Um, I wanted to touch briefly on, on Molly's cadence and, and her gearing. She's running a 5614 on this fixed gear bicycle, which she can, of course, never stop pedaling. And I think she's doing, Jim reports that she ought to be doing around 90 RPM. It's my impression that this is a bit slower than what she tends to do on her road time trial bike, just from my experience observing her. But uh, uh, I didn't have a chance to check with Rob Van Howling about exactly what that is. But uh, because of, you know, the need to, to run a big gear for these incredible speeds, whereas on a, a geared bike, you might be able to select gears and change your cadence and your gearing up a little bit, and she might be pedaling a little bit faster. Um, uh, it's, it's a bit slower uh, in this case. I wanted to also talk briefly about uh, Molly's coach, who I think she wanted to give a shout out to. She's been coached by Dave Jordan, uh, the longtime UC Irvine cycling coach since two, uh, 2008. Uh, she contacted him after noting that one of our friendly rivals in uh, Northern California local women's racing, Jane Despis, uh, managed to race very strongly and consistently while still holding a demanding Silicon Valley job. Uh, while she sees Dave only a few times a year, he uh, constantly adjusts her training plan to the newest challenges. Just touching on one thing back there that uh, Ellen mentioned about, uh, that 5614 gear combination that Molly's riding, if you're familiar with the concept of gear inches, uh, she's riding 108 gear inches. That is a big gear. Uh, we had another topic here, uh, just trying to imagine what might be going on in Molly's mind, so we called that, what, what is Molly thinking about? Uh, the, the, the first thing is, is very important here, uh, Molly has kind of developed a theme that she calls her, her she calls her team, uh, her, her, her effort theme. here, the group of people that are supporting it, she calls it uh, <laughs> Team Tortuga. Well, Tortuga is the Spanish word for tortoise or turtle. And you may wonder where, where that, where, why that name was chosen. Well, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, wind tunnel testing. Molly uh, has done extensive wind tunnel testing. I, I've done testing myself. And the, and the lesson that comes out of that is that the, the most important thing you can do is get your head out of the way. It's so crazy what a big giant windsock the I human know. head is. Yeah, you think <laughs> your head's so important, you, you don't want to hide it, but that's, that's the place where you want to hide it. So sometimes that uh, notion of kind of tucking your head in, it's, it's called tucking or turtling. And so that's where the tortuga comes into it. Uh, what other things is Molly thinking about? In, in, in an attempt like this, she has to maintain an intense focus. Uh, and, and, and I think that's probably why w another area where her, her intellectual capacity plays in her favor, she is able to maintain focus. Uh, she wants to keep her upper body still. You want to follow that black line. Uh, you want to control your breathing. And then you, you want to be right on your, your target lap splits. It's kind of crazy how this seemingly straightforward list of things, uh, it's uh, kind of, for me at least, I'm quite a bit less talented than Molly. It's uh, quite a bit to keep track of when you're absolutely riding on your limit. So uh, these are, you know, she really does have to focus. There are things as well to mention that Molly doesn't want to focus on. Um, it's uh, would never be good to focus on, uh, you know, how fearful you are of uh, you know, what you might or might not achieve, how uncomfortable you are. It's tremendously uncomfortable to be putting out this kind of effort. Um, your body, when your body's just screaming at you, you absolutely can't focus on that or how much you wish it was over with. You have to uh, simply, although it's impossible to erase these things, you have to kind of, and Molly is, is keeping in the moment and just focusing on what is important at each moment for each pedal stroke within each lap. 
So uh, how about we touch a bit on Molly's equipment? Sure. You want to go over a list there, Jim? Yeah, we have, uh, you have some of you folks might like to know uh, the details of her equipment. Uh, the bicycle she's riding is a Cervelo T4. The wheels she's using are Mavic uh, Comite discs with uh, ceramic speed bearings. Her aero bars are USC Tula aero bars with uh, head extensions. The tires are uh, Vittoria Pista EVOs. Uh, we mentioned before the gearing is 5614. The drivetrain is a door ace chain and with cogs. Uh, the saddle is a dash stage nine and the pedals are speed play zeros. Uh, I will mention the accessories that Molly carries on her body. She's wearing a specialized S-Works time trial helmet, and she's gone through a number of time trial helmets throughout the evolution of her, um, her, her position, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, she's also tried out several skin suits, often each one time test or, uh, tested in the wind tunnel uh, for for speediness over time and today the speediest suit has been determined to be the Pearl Izumi Mach 5. She's wearing Giro Empire shoes which are notably lace-ups and of course she cannot use shoe covers as this is against the UCI rules for an indoor attempt uh, and are often non-beneficial anyway as by the uh, um, the the rules and the shoes are a fairly smooth surface and probably arrow in spite of the laces. And she uh, is wearing socks under there, but they're hiding, making it appear that she's not wearing any. We want to show some Molly progression. This is pre-Tortuga. This is an early wind tunnel test, and look how how upright, and you know her head is just sticking way up there, not Tortuga at all. Um, uh, so a, a very early session. That, that photo, Ellen, it was done at the uh, low-speed wind tunnel ah, uh, in down San in Diego. San Diego. Gotcha. Um, and then here's a picture of Molly riding the Puda Creek time trial. Thanks to Mark Adkinson for that great photo he gets out there and takes has been taking photos of that uh, low-key event for years. She's uh, wearing shoe covers that are made of lycra, and her head is significantly down but still a bit high and I think that uh, she's has a significantly different uh, bike and potentially saddle position and an aero bar set up but she's on her way to Tortuga and uh, finally we have her in her current suit on the Cervelo track bike that she's riding today pretty much in her current position sockless or rather looking sockless, those shoes, and just looking very, very tucked in Tortuga with that head as part of the, um, part of the profile. So uh, it's, it's been a lengthy evolution, but uh, she has, uh, uh, you know, through increased performance, uh, I, I a lot of hard work and all this position, she's put herself in a position to take a world record. Those those photos, uh, Ellen, are, are dramatic. Dramatic. Uh, you, you just you just can't believe how much she's improved. Uh, that last photo, incidentally, was uh, taken at the uh, specialized uh, wind tunnel in Morgan Hill, uh, California. Uh, specialized has been one of uh, Molly's supporters, and and thanks to them too for uh, providing that photo. Great. So uh, to to sum up the. The aerodynamics of all of this is each one of these little pieces of gear makes a difference, but probably we think the single biggest factor has got to be that Tortuga, which um, can I just note that, again, I'm not as incredibly flexible and uh, tolerant of pain probably as Molly, but actually ducking your head down like that is really hard. And she makes it look so easy, but it's not. Yeah, it, I, I've, I've tried, I'm not flexible either, and uh, I've, I've tried to hold that position. I, I can maybe do that for what I'm doing, like a two-kilometer pursuit, which is about three minutes, but I, I could not contemplate holding that position for an hour. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing that she can do that. So, Molly, uh, you know, I was a bit surprised to learn this, but... Um when I hadn't known her for quite so long, I discovered that uh, she credits her history as a synchronized swimmer, in fact, uh, partially uh, for her ability to hold a strange contorted position, such as the tuck and the tor 
um, the tortoise head. Um, she's got a lot of flexibility and uh, recall any, any synchronized swimming you've ever seen. Those, they're gymnasts in the pool. So she had a earlier life experience. I believe it was in perhaps high school or college when she was in competitive synchronized swimming. And uh, she took that and who would have ever thunk that synchronized swimming would set you up to prepare for a, to become a world-class time trialist. Well, we're, uh, we're into the last 15 minutes, and I'm sure many of you have heard that th that's when the hard part starts. Uh, Molly, it's, it's, you can't say she's been riding comfortably up to this point, but let's just say relatively so. You start getting down to that last 10 or 15 minutes is when it really, really starts to hurt. Um, she's... She's, uh, uh, the last time, we, we kind of lost our graphic there temporarily, but I think the last time I saw it, she was about uh, 12 seconds uh, ahead of her, her target schedule. And her lap splits have pretty much been right on this whole time. As long as she can maintain consistency, she's, uh, she's, she's on target. Uh, yeah, and she's still doing, she's still doing a, a good job of holding the black line. That's, that's one of the things that they can kind of fall apart on you. Uh, the tighter you get, uh, you, you, you're, you're going around those turns there at, at a very high speed. Centrifugal force tends to throw you up, um, up, up, up the track. The, the banking, uh, the steep bank, the 42 degree banking in, the, in those turns help, helps to hold you down. Uh, but there's still a lot of the centrifugal force that wants, wants to get you up away from that black line. And I'm, I'm pleased to see that she's still doing so well with that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised that Molly has gone a little bit ahead of schedule. Uh, that, that's a very typical way to do it. it I, I, I call it putting money in the bank. <laughs> um, if, if she is, is forced to slow down a bit on the last five or minute to ten minutes, she's got a little bit of leeway built in. Um, I think she so, so far is in a better position than she, she was uh, when she did her effort back here on July 3rd. Uh, I, I think if, if I remember her, her maximum advantage over the, her, her target time was about seven seconds. And I think she had about seven seconds in the bank uh, with about 10 minutes left to go. And uh, during that last 10 minutes, she, she gave up a good portion of that. So I, uh, in spite of the fact that we've lost our graphic, I uh, just got flagged down by one of our uh, unofficial timers. And uh, she informs me that we're still about 12 seconds up. So things are looking good. And you can hear Rob down on the track, although perhaps not on the live feed, yelling, yelling laps. And, and she seems to be still right on target. So uh, Jim's standing up to well, have yeah, a better gander. I was, I was gander. trying to see if I could see <laughs> the lap cards from my position, but unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, I can't. Uh, they're they're facing the opposite direction, so I can't read them here. At this point, though, I believe that we would most likely be beyond 100 laps. And hey, if they only had to two ditches, we've sort of run out of room, right. haven't they, they we? They had to wrap back around. Okay, to zero. I guess <laughs> they could wrap back around to zero, but. Uh, I know when they first had it set up, they only had two digits displayed. Uh, usually they have uh, th three digits available to them. So, so once it goes over 100, you, you have that one that's visible. But of course, uh, Molly knows that uh, if it says zero, it's really 100. So uh, I don't know if you uh, wanted to go over the last lap rule here. Um, and this well, has to do with how her total distance will be measured. Yeah, let me dig up uh, just a moment. Uh, let sure. me dig up my notes on that, Ellen. Yeah, take your time. Um, it's uh, hard for me to say since I don't have the uh, the the bar in front of me how much time she has left, but I believe it to be about ten minutes. Um, and like Jim said, she's still doing a fairly good job of holding the black line. And I hear. Didn't hear anything from Rob that particular. We have a nice lap, perfect verbal. Um, so still should be on target. Oh, uh, you know, one thing we've failed to mention is um, some of these key checkpoints um, uh, for time. Um, at, uh, let's see, uh, at 
at 50 minutes, um, which I, in my estimate should be coming up pretty soon here, uh, she would have gotten through 154 laps. That would be 38 point or uh, 38 uh, 38,500 meters. Uh, so we'll we'll just see if our display comes back. But uh, in the meantime, tell us about the last lap rule. Okay. Well, the, the last lap rule is is a little bit complicated. Uh, I think I can best explain it by giving by giving you an example. Suppose it's getting very near the end of the hour. Uh, let's suppose, uh, just to have a round number, that Molly's doing her laps in 20 seconds each. She's doing faster than that, but let's use a round number. Suppose she comes across the, the timing line, and uh, the, the complete elapsed time at that point is 59 minutes and 45 seconds. Okay, so that means that Molly still has 15 seconds to go, but it takes her 20 seconds to do a lap, so she's not going to get a complete lap on that last lap. Well, how, how, do they, uh, how do they handle that? Well, the officials will ring a bell. Uh, presumably, we'll be able to hear that when, when they think that Molly is going to be on her last lap. She rides that last lap at full speed and crosses the timing line for a final time, let's say in this case with a cumulative time of one hour and five seconds because she had 15 seconds to go. She rode that last lap in 20 seconds. So the last lap, uh, saying the last lap took 20 seconds. She will get credit for three-fourths of a lap since she had 15 seconds remaining and it took her 20 seconds to cover the last lap. So she would get credit for three-fourths of a lap, which would be 187.5 180, meters, which would be truncated down to 187 meters. So her total distance would then be 250 times the number of complete laps plus 187, and that would be her distance that she records. I just got word that she is now 13 seconds up on the hour record, um, and uh, I heard, gosh, I, I don't know how many laps she has yet to go, but Rob's still yelling verbal cues at her that indicate she's either right on target pace or, yes, I just heard a perfect for right on target pace. She even rode a couple of laps a bit too fast and he was yelling at her to maybe rein it in a bit. So uh, things are going well. Let's see, uh, according oh. to, oh, um, looks like we're, um, um, according to this unofficial timer, Jim has a, developed a neat little app for his phone that us two announcers are looking at. Our running time is coming up around 53 minutes. So we are running out of time here, but uh, Molly's still writing a, a great schedule. If she's uh, 13 seconds up at this point and she keeps gaining at this rate, uh, that's, that's going to be like a good, decent amount of uh, extra lap that's beyond right. the record, right? Yeah, if she could hold that, well, I mean, she's basically doing 19 second, uh, between 19 and 20 second lap. Uh, 13 seconds ahead would, would give her about three quarters of a lap. It's a decent uh, distance. If she can hold that. Uh, I'm rooting for her to do so. I, I know from experience how hard it gets in these last few minutes. Looks like she just yeah, completed her 165th uh, lap, and that, she's the on voice her that you hear repeatedly calling out um, lap, is, is so, uh, uh, Rob. We're calling out. Um, uh, eight, 18 he, laps he likes to, go. to use the word perfect. See and if I've she heard can him get use that, that done word by the end of the of hour. Times. I didn't have a chance to talk with Rob and Molly. Uh, what, what they set their target distance for. I mean, of course, they would have set it at least uh, for uh, Von Morsel's distance, 46.065. Um, I, I, I didn't have an opportunity to, 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 decide, uh, to hear what, what their actual target was. Uh, but uh, she is probably riding, she's probably riding very close to it, just from the number of times that I've heard uh, Rob call out uh, uh, per perfect, uh, perfect. Perfect lap. She's just ridden 168 laps. I went over there and cheated and looked at the sheet. And, uh, uh, 
and well we may have to start oh. do, we may have to start doing our own count uh let's let's migrate over over here jim to where we can actually uh see uh unfortunately the viewer can't see this but uh we've got a working display over here as we now kind we, of get down moved to the to wire a position where i thought we could see the lap count but uh, we still cannot see it from here. Oh, whoa, it's on the screen. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. We, we do have the information. Uh, just finished 170 laps. And she is 14 seconds uh, ahead of her target. Still riding very consistent lap splits. We, that was a 19.44, and that's pretty much exactly what we were seeing at the beginning of the hour. Okay, we have our counter back viewers. You can see uh, 50, coming up on 56 minutes, four minutes left. She's 14.2 seconds down from the hour. I'm starting to get prickles on the back I, of my I, neck, I'm Jim. I'm starting to think it might happen, Ellen. <laughs> I'm, I'm really optimistic at this point. She's less than, uh, less than five minutes to go. Well, I got to be honest. I didn't want to get super excited <laughs> at the beginning of the hour because, I mean, Molly, uh, you know, she can't see her um, making a mistake like Jack Bowbridge did. But, um, you know, I mean, even she, uh, you know, faces limits and things start to get hard. So... Uh, you know, being just a tiny bit positive up on, on her pacing at the beginning, I, I didn't want to assume that there was too much money in the bank. But here we are. Oh, she just did a, a negative split. Um, yeah. It's, uh, boy. Okay. I'm back to... Back to fairly consistent, but she's uh, get, yeah, she's getting close she's, to 15 she, seconds. She ain't uh, slowing down. No, she is not. Uh, I'm slightly puzzled why our, our timer uh, field is not updating right now. Um, That's all right. There it is. Oh, there it updated. We're starting to hear she's some in the last shouts three minutes, from the velodrome. The last, in the last three minutes, folks. I I am pretty confident at this point that she's going to do it. Uh, notice that she's maintained that uh, that tucked head, that that tortuga uh, position. She has never varied from that. Uh, she has never come off of the arrow bars. Just just solid as a rock. I have to say though that I do see just a tiny bit of upper body movement where I might not have before. So I would guess that uh, she'll be telling us that she was uh, feeling it at this. Uh, at the very end of this hour, but, you know, considering, um, you know, how much it might be hurting, she's still riding extraordinarily okay, we're consistently. Right about two, two minutes to go, about two minutes to go. I'm pretty sure she can ride two laps in a couple I, minutes, don't I, you think? I think maybe, I think maybe she can. She'll get close with, with two minutes. Um. But she's not going to give up here because... The further that she rides beyond the current record, the longer she has a chance of holding on to that for a long That's while. That's right. You, you never know how long a record's going to hold up. I, I think she's going to set a, uh, a tough mark here for people to come, uh, to come up against. This is great. At 15 seconds, uh, she's uh, over. The, I mean, if she holds this, she's going to be over three quarters of a lap up on the current record. Yeah, she's she's all she's going to uh, she's going to add almost a, almost a full lap to to the uh, to the record. M maybe not quite, but it's going to be it's going to be close. There's a ha ha the the noise in the velodrome is starting to excite me. There's a not a huge next lap is the bell lap, by the way. Uh, is that right? I, yeah, I don't think it should be I right. I don't think it's quite. But well, they're apparently, you know, the official timing is probably different. So yeah, it's uh, a, a little bit different. Okay, so the end of her hour uh, is going we, to end at some point in this lap. We haven't heard the bell yet, but it's going to oh. it's going to be close. Uh, this lap, when she crosses this lap, she's going to have 46 kilometers, and if she goes beyond a quarter lap beyond this, she is P 
passed it. She has now got the world record. Molly Van Helling has just set the women's world hour record. So every, every meter she covers now, go Molly, Molly, Molly! Okay, she did about, I'm, I'm saying it's going to be around 46.3 kilometers. Now she's there really she's going fast. She still has to finish this lap. She's, she, 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 we have to admit that we, we she, are not uh, uh, objective, neutral just uh, commentators here. <laughs> We're we, big fans of Molly, and she did it. Outstanding. Look at her. Look so at it'll, her. So it'll take a while for the, um, for the, oh, Molly! Sorry, oh, yeah, we can't yeah, help yeah, but cheer. <laughs> oh, she has a huge <laughs> grin on her face. Yeah. I she, she that's not a grimace, I can to tell. Give us a big smile when she yep. came by. <laughs> big smile. You can see, oh, I'm so look happy at her head her. bobbing. She's just, she must have just been on the ragged edge of that breathing. Oh. She's taking huge gulps of air. But, uh, you know, those last two laps, I was kind of a little fixated on the track. But, uh, you know, in l looking down at the, the timer a bit, I saw a couple of, you know, huge negative splits on those last couple laps. So, um, well, at the, at the just, end, you know, if you have anything left, yeah, well, you don't that have was to worry. It. That was it. That's a bit, <laughs> you, you can afford to go anaerobic at the end. Uh, you obviously have to keep things in the in the aerobic range uh, during the, the great bulk of the hour. When you get down to about two minutes to go, then you can just spend whatever's left, and that's what she did. She really finished strong. Wow, what an achievement! You've seen a piece of history here, folks. That is a new women's world record. So uh, I think uh, I'm gonna make my way down to the track uh you'll you'll have to keep uh keep the the folks busy jim while i'm going okay. down there well but, uh, yeah i only want to think that i would like to uh you know at some point when she gets her breath again see if i can uh, get a few words out of molly uh, okay <laughs> she, she's probably able to to talk I, I remember when she she finished her um her hour back in uh in july on july 3rd when she did that uh, she seemed uh, amazingly composed. You, you sometimes see these people that do these hours uh, just totally collapse after the end of uh, end of the rap. I mean, I remember when, when Sarah Story uh, did her record; uh, she was exhausted and, and just lying on the uh, on the apron for for a considerable time before she could she could move. Um, I think Molly is still, she's just, she was just calming down, quieting down here, trying to, trying to compose herself a little bit. I, I, I know she, she knows there's going to be people down there interviewing her, asking questions, and uh, uh, she probably wants to be ready to, to, uh, to, to talk to whoever, whoever wants to talk to her at that point. Oh, uh, I like that, that big smile on her face. Well, I can't I can't say enough about the the advantages of riding uh, riding here at the Aguas Calientes track. I mean, uh, Ellen mentioned about my record attempts here last year. Uh, there have been so many records uh, set here. Uh, just as another example, back in July, one of our local cycling coaches, uh, Lee Povey, brought a group of seven people down here. Uh, we, we all came down to do record attempts, uh, and. And of course, there she's there. She stopped. <laughs> okay, look at that smile, folks. Oh boy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, that is so good. So when we had, there were seven of us here doing record attempts, and um, everyone in the group set at least a national record. Uh, five of the people set world records. Uh, two or three of those set multiple world records. And of course, Molly's uh, Molly's hour was was uh, was one of those. So there, you're looking at the new women's hour record holder, folks. Um, Metro Mint is her cycling club. She's been a member of that club for a long time. And and uh, one one thing she said that she's kind of missed about uh, the the training she's had to do this year 
is that she hasn't been able to do the, the road racing that she typically does with her, with her uh, measurement teams. Uh, the hour record attempt planning and training, it's a, it's a very solo thing. You, I mean, you really have to do it all yourself. Uh, she's coming up here to, to, to see someone. I know who she's. Oh, oh she's coming up talking to some people in the audience. <laughs> well, un, un, uh, it, unfortunately, we didn't have much of a crowd here tonight. We didn't expect that. Um, they're they're um, kind of hard to estimate. I'd say uh, maybe there, there's maybe a total of 50 people here. Uh, we have nine officials, so we, we have plenty of those. And um, I think they're getting, they're getting some pictures down there. Rob's getting some pictures of her down there with, uh, with people that are, that are grading her. Uh, it, it typically takes the official, I would say, between five and ten minutes to, to make that final determination. I mean, I explained how that last lap rule is done, but um, of course they want to uh, make dead sure that they've got it right because this, this is going to be worldwide news. This will be in the cycling press all over the world. I got, I got six minutes left. And... Um, I, I, I can't, it was a story I, I, I wanted to tell during, the, during our commentary, but I didn't have a chance to. I, I, I had to, the, 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 suppose you pose the following question. What, what do you do on the day after you set the cycling world record? Well, I w back in July when, when Molly set the record, uh, she said she did that, I think it was on a, uh, I think that was on a Saturday. What did she do on Sunday? Okay, I, I think... Uh, I think Ellen's down there ready to, uh, to, 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 to interview Molly. So I'll let, let, let Ellen take it now. So uh, I, uh, I have walked down here to trackside with our new world record holder, Molly Van Howling. You, uh, you, you look great and you, you, you're not, you know, totally incoherent or anything. <laughs> tell, tell me how, how how does it feel after an effort like that? Thanks, Ellen. I, uh, I just feel really fortunate. You know from being a racer who's done lots of you know, national and world-class races, you never know if everything's going to come together on race day. All you can do is you know, try to control everything in your control. And every day this week, I've been thinking, does my knee hurt? Am I getting the sniffles? Am I going to be 100%? And, um, and, uh, and you know, is it going to be too hot, too cold? Um, so I feel very fortunate that everything seemed to come together today, and, uh, and it felt pretty in control, which was my plan. But uh, last time I felt in control, and then this time I felt in control until the last few minutes when I felt some Team Tortuga power speeding me up a little bit. So uh, it wasn't my fault. That was my that was my friends uh, who were sending me a little extra power for the. Thanks to all those friends who were sending extra power. It's, uh, it, it was important. Um, Jim and I were wondering how much joy, but how much relief is the balance here that you feel? Um, it's definitely both. Uh, I, uh, you know, when you first get here, you think, do I have enough time to get ready? It's only a week away, only six days away, only five days away. And I think if your preparation goes well, by the end, you're like, Let's get this thing over with. And, uh, and I was about at that point today. So, uh, you know, until it's over, there's always an anxiety that something can go wrong. So I am relieved that, uh, that nothing went wrong. And, uh, and I wanted to come through for the people who are watching and, uh, and the people who've done so much uh, to contribute to um, make this live stream possible. And uh, lots of people, work, family, friends, have made sacrifices so that I could do this special once in a lifetime thing. Um, so I wanted to come through for them. And you did marvelously. Um, we, we wanted to, you know, I know Rob had like something to do with pulling this off. Uh, I uh, maybe just talk briefly about how you work as a team. <laughs> I'm giggling because uh, Mark Florence, who does the uh, Cycling Time Trial podcast, had a preview of the attempt with Michael Hutchinson, who is an hour record attempter himself and a great author and, and specialist on cycling. And I think it was Dr. Hutchinson who said that an hour record is 
one-third horsepower, one-third aerodynamics, and one-third logistics. And I laughed and I thought, it's way more than one-third logistics. Um, and everyone knows that that's, that's Rob. And um, it, it's crazy the amount of time and energy uh, that he puts into uh, um, to the equipment and think all day today. I couldn't get his attention because he was like, like this on weather.com to try to figure out when was the barometric pressure and temperature going to be ideal for the attempt. So um, he thought about every little thing and um, I, I can't uh, concentrate on the execution and my training and my nutrition and everything else, even with the help of my coach, Dave Jordan, and my nutritionist, Jan Guzman, uh, still I couldn't do I can't do any any more, and so Rob takes up the slack, and I think the slack is really like 90 percent. And uh, then, and again, I um, I was motivated to put up my 10 percent uh, to make up the difference. Well, as a team, you bring it all together. There's uh, just one last little thing we were wondering about your ride today. At what point, if if any point, surely at the very end though. But how about how far into the ride did it seem? really hard. So Ellen, I'm laughing again because sure. Ellen knows, some of you might have read my race report from my very first US record, where I said that one of my friends sent me spider monkey power before the race, and another one told me to set that velodrome on fire. And that was you, Ellen. So to get through the end, that time I said that I had to think about flaming spider monkeys. And this week I was, I was you know how you're supposed to like do mental imagery of a successful race? So I was thinking about how when the going got tough, I was going to feel the flaming spider monkeys like behind me, pushing me and keeping me on the black line. And I felt mostly today so good and I had to hold back a little bit. I was like, keep those spider monkeys in their cage <laughs> until, I don't know, maybe the last seven minutes or so. I let the spider monkeys come out a little bit. Let the spider monkeys be free. Okay, I uh, I imagine. Ah, we have a a little a little plaque we have to present. Here we go, a new world record holder, everyone, Molly Schaefer Van Howling, the twelfth of September, twenty fifteen. Forty six point two seven four kilometers appears to be official. And I don't know if uh, viewers can see it uh, from the feed, but we have a slew of uh, A slew of, of folks wanting to take photos of Molly and Rob and the director of the velodrome again here. She she's just now seeing how far she went. Forty six point two seven four. So another huge smile from Molly Van Howling. We have cheers for Molly here. Thanks again all you Kickstarter folks who contributed. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure to be here um, commentating on, on this amazing achievement for you and I hope you are all suitably entertained. Or what?